Kel. Heads up behind you, Kel. Watch your step. <laughs> Sorry. You ever wonder why they call bird shit guano? Nah. I just call it bird shit. Yeah. Me too. You know something, when I worked in a zoo, birds used to scare the hell out of me. Lions, tigers, no problem. That's the kind of sense the way big cats operate, but ostriches. Those things are disembowelled for looking at them sideways. You gotta eat more birds. It's almost boss. Wonder what seagull tastes like. Not chicken. <laughs> Hi. Hey, buddy. Hi. Um, no, he just likes you better. Right? She's not here? She was tracking something. Said she'd miss back here. Should have been back by now. It's not your fault. Did I ever tell you about my brother, Merle? Uh, Merle. Okay. This one time, he takes me fishing, right? Fishing, right? On this big lake, right? Which is a uh, private property, right? In this boat, which is, uh, Stolen, stolen boat, right? And he's drinking, right? So he's fishing, he's drinking. He falls in the lake, like, right? I have to take him uh, like this, swim him all the way back. I save his life, right? You know what he says to me? 
dummy. Go get the beer. Idiot, right? Yeah. It's gonna be all right. Come on. Good dog, good dog. We've got to get her back to Hell Top. Nah, I think we got to find somewhere closer. Tell him what? Did you know about this? she's saying. I said I don't trust you. What's your problem? Huh? Hilltop takes you in. They got sick children and mouths to feed and you steal from them. All you're good for is talking shit. Mr. Crossbow, I thought aiming was your thing. It's definitely not your thing. Mm -mm. Sorry, it doesn't count. Of course that counts. No, you gotta knock the can over. You can't just kiss it. Oh my God, you're such a sore loser. I'd have to lose in order to be a sore loser, so since that didn't count, I'm gonna take my turn. Oh, it's a double capper. They're good luck. Maybe it'll help your aim. Very funny. But I'll keep it. You should watch your own throws, though. Boom. How was Hilltop? It's fine. King sends his best. Connie fine, too? <laughs> what? You see things. It's not like that. No? Nope. Not at all. Why not? There aren't that many people left to find out there these days. Much less good ones like her. Yeah, I know. Well, then why not? What's the matter? Because it does. You don't have to be alone. Years past, Daryl. She can't hide out with her dog forever. <laughs> oh, see? Your aim's better already. I'm hungry. You got food? Yeah, I'll get it.
Take the higher ground. Yeah. Good idea. Come on. I don't understand. We use walkers to protect themselves, right? So we go up, someplace the walkers can't go. We separate the living from the dead. They travel in a herd, but there's only like five or six of them in the middle, right? Yeah, but if we go up there, we're trapped. Alva's not gonna send an army because she doesn't have to. She'll send Beta. I'm sick of running. This Beta, either best, good. Kill him first. Come on. The stairwell's already barricaded. I guess you know that. Thanks. Yeah, a little secret stash for emergency. Smart. There's only two ways up. That's good. I think this, the barricades are a little too barricaded. So we'll cut open holes so that they can walk up here. Right? Nice. This place is good. This might work. Uh, then what? Then we go. die. Your friends do. Yes. People like Daryl Dixon would rather disappear into the woods without a trace than open up to the world. He's a loner, a black sheep, and it took the end of days for him to finally find his kin. This is his story so far. At the dawn of the apocalypse, Merle is the only family Daryl has left. His brother is crude and racist, but Daryl learned everything he knows from him, for better or worse. They were both victims of their father's abuse. Even then, Daryl depended on Merle for survival. So when he finds out that some goody-goody cop handcuffed his brother and abandoned him, Daryl goes on the attack. They return to the rooftop and find Merle's hacksawed hand, no body left to speak of. That scene brings Daryl to tears. 
his tough guy shell torn wide open. That's the thing with Daryl. He's hard as nails, but once he lets someone in, he die for them. On more than a few occasions after that, his violent temperament gets the better of him, and he lashes out. It's a trait that will come back to bite him down the line. But Daryl has a soft side. He shows his true colors when Carol's daughter Sophia goes missing. He's the only person who doesn't give up on her, continue the search night after night. He even brings Carol a Cherokee rose as a symbol of hope. It's also a symbol of their blossoming friendship. Whether it's due to their soft-spoken mannerisms or shared survival stories, the two bloom into best friends. She's more of a friend than Merle ever was to Daryl. And he comes to see that after a near-death experience in the woods. <laughs> well, what's the matter, Darlena? Is that all you got in you? <clears throat> Throw that person climb. I did better when he was missing. Now, come on, don't be like that. I'm on your side. Yeah, since when? Hell, since the day you were born, baby brother. Somebody had to look after your worthless ass. He never took care of me. Talk a big game, but he was never there. How do you get here now? Some things never change. Well, I tell you what, I'm as real as your chubacabra. I know what I saw. <laughs> And I'm sure them shrooms you ate had nothing to do with it, right? You best shut the hell up. Or what? You gonna come up here and shut my mouth for me? Well, come on and do it then. You think you're man enough? <laughs> hey, kick off them damn high heels and climb, son. <laughs> Heck, he even comes around on that goody-goody cop Rick Grimes. Daryl wins a lot of points with him by shouldering the burden of Randall's torture and by mercy killing Dell. They don't totally see eye to eye just yet, but at least they're not trading haymakers on the side of the road. When Rick loses Lori in a Walker prison ambush, he's distraught. Oh, no. <laughs> Daryl has to take charge. You got anything a baby can eat? The good news is she looks healthy, but she needs formula, and soon or she won't survive. No, nope, no way. Not her. We ain't losing nobody else. I'm going for a run. I'll back you up. I'll go, too. OK, I think where we're going, Beth. Kid just lost his mom. His dad ain't doing so hard. I'll look out for him. You two get the fence. Too many pile up. We got ourselves a problem. Glenn, Maggie's, Vominos, Rick. Get the gate. Come on, we're going to lose a life. It's the first time we really see his potential as a leader, but he's hurting too. Carol disappeared in that same ambush, so Daryl is furious at himself for failing her again, the same way he blamed himself for Sophia's death. Carol turns up safe and sound, of course, but it's a close call. She's not the only one who skirted death, though. Merle is alive and kicking too. Daryl comes face to face with him when the governor forces them to duel to the death. Y'all know me! I'm gonna do whatever I gotta do to prove! That my loyalty is to this town! This asshole's gonna let you go. Just follow my lead, little brother. We're getting out of this. With some quick thinking by Merle, they escape his clutches. But the others are none too pleased to have him hanging around again. So Daryl defaults to his old ways. He and Merle take off on their own. But Daryl is a different man now. And their time together shows just how far he strayed from his brother's shadow. In the end, Merle gets slaughtered by the governor. And Daryl finds him undead.
They may have had their differences, but family is family. And Merle was his only family. Daryl was crushed. The war with the governor decimates the prison community and scatters their survivors into the wild. This time, Daryl ends up on the road with Beck. There's something going on between the two, but whatever it is, Daryl can't understand it. See, Beth had the exact opposite childhood of Daryl. She was raised in a loving home with a big family, and most importantly, she was forbidden from drinking alcohol. But all this is gone now, so she and Daryl get wasted on old moonshine. Under the influence, Daryl's feelings about Merle boil to the surface. You wanna know where I was before all this? I was just drifting around with Marl. Doing whatever he said we were gonna be doing that day. Nobody. Nothing. Some redneck asshole with even bigger asshole for a brother. He opens up about his rough life and the sense of worthlessness that it instilled in him. With the remainder of the moonshine, he and Beth torch the cabin, a giant middle finger to the past. As we know, it takes time for Daryl to warm up to new people. But just as he's feeling that heat with Beth, she gets snatched. How many times will Daryl have to go looking for someone he cares about? With some help from Carol, they finally find Beth at Grady Memorial Hospital but Beth is killed by Dawn during the exchange. In a blind fury, Daryl kills Dawn. Despite all the carnage in Daryl's life, he still has a family to lean on. People like Rick Michonne and Carl have become his new clan. Daryl has the chance to prove it to them when they're all attacked by the claimers. <clears throat> now, who's gonna count down the ball dropper with me, huh? 10 Mississippi. Nine, Mississippi. Eight, Mississippi. Go. Hold up. You're stopping me on eight, Daryl. Just hold up. This is the guy that killed Lou, so we got nothing to talk about. The thing about nowadays is we got nothing but time. Say your piece, Daryl. These people. Don't let him go. These are good people. After Beth's disappearance, Daryl has an out, an excuse to return to the brazen lifestyle he has always known. The claimers lured him in with their simple code of survival. Once he learns that they're coming after Rick, he turns on them. In the aftermath of the attack, Rick assures him that the two of them are brothers now. Hey, it's not on you. You've been back with us here now. That's everything. You're my brother. Who would have thought that Goody Goody Cop would be truer family than Daryl's own blood? Daryl first crosses paths with the Saviors when he meets Dwight and Sherry. They're on the run from the sanctuary and they take advantage of Daryl's mercy by stealing his bike and crossbow. Tensions run high between Alexandria's safe zone and the Saviors, made no easier by the fact that Daryl blows some of them to hell with an RPG. When Dwight returns and kills Denise, things get personal. It's yet another death that Daryl blames on himself, and he's hell-bent for revenge. That recklessness only lands him in a trap, setting up the worst mistake of Daryl's life. Remember how, after Merle's death, Daryl would lash out at Rick and the others? Well, after Negan kills Abraham, he does the very same thing to him. That may have been okay once upon a time, but those outbursts don't fly anymore. He said, I will shut that shit down. No exceptions. Negan retaliates by killing Glenn. It's the most powerless Daryl has ever felt. It's made worse by the fact that Negan enslaves him at the sanctuary. As a prisoner, Daryl gets tortured daily. The saviors make him wear a sweatsuit with a big A on it for asshole. They feed him dog food, 
They play a horrible, horrible pop song. Worst of all, they leave a photo of Glenn's squashed head in his cell. The reminders of the guilt that Daryl already feels over his actions. Despite it all, he knows that the only way to honor Glenn's memory is to resist. When he finally escapes and returns to the hilltop colony, he has to face Maggie. At first, he can't bring himself to do it, but eventually he breaks down and apologizes. Maggie forgives him, reminding him that Glenn believes Daryl was one of the good things in the world. I'm sorry. Stop it. It wasn't your fault. It was. No. It wasn't. You're one of the good things in this world. That's what Glenn thought. And he would know. Because he was one of the good things too. Daryl doesn't have to feel worthless anymore. By the end of the war, Rick decides to spare Negan's life. Needless to say, neither Maggie nor Daryl are thrilled about that choice. Rick's mercy was always a source of contention between him and Daryl. For instance, they once came to blows over a truck of explosives. Daryl wanted to use them to blow the sanctuary to pieces, but Rick was concerned about the innocents who lived there. There's a plan, and everyone's sticking to it. Not everyone. There's a lot of our people that are dead, Rick. Things change, man. Negan and that other group? This is on them. People die. It's their fault, not ours. Daryl, we can't do this. And we got our own people to look after. From Daryl's point of view, the group needs to put themselves before anything else, whatever casualties that leaves. So he's just as unhappy when Rick appoints him leader of the saviors. For a year and a half, Daryl runs the sanctuary until he and Maggie decide that enough is enough. While she goes to kill Negan, Daryl distracts Rick it gives the brothers a chance to hash out their issues. Daryl tells Rick something that no one else could say to him. I would have died for Carl. You know that. But you gotta hear me. You're chasing something for him that ain't meant to be, man. Carl is gone, and to preserve his legacy is to chase a ghost. You just gotta let him go. He died for him, but not like this. It's their final conversation before Rick disappears. In the following year, Daryl explores the riverbank, searching for some sign of Rick. In spite of all his tracking abilities, he comes up dry. Of all the people he's lost, this one hits the hardest. Wounded by his failure, Daryl turns his back on Alexandria and resigns himself to the woods for six years. His only company is a wild dog that he names Dog. There he stays until Carol convinces him to come back into civilization. He returns just in time to face the threat of the Whisperers. When the group captures Lydia, Daryl avoids going full judge, jury, executioner on her, as he'd once done with Randall. Instead, he takes the time to assess the situation and get to know the girl. He even takes Lydia under his wing. The rest of the Alexandrians cast her out, but he knows what it's like to be the person with the messed up childhood. With Rick gone, Daryl takes on new leadership responsibilities. Just as Rick once faced down the governor at the gates of the prison, Daryl faces Alpha at the walls of Alexandria. He's the one making the calls now. No fight you're looking for. We got enough firepower to light you up. Right here and now. Thanks to the lessons he learned from Rick and Glenn and Herschel, he's equipped to handle each situation with a level-headedness that the old Daryl never could have. Oh, he also bonds with Connie, but who knows what's happening there. He is learning ASL for her, and they did take down Beta together, so maybe Carol's right. Maybe there's hope for this old dog yet. But for now, there are other things to worry about. Carol has been acting recklessly since the death of her son at Alpha's hands. Daryl knows the cost of that recklessness, so he tries to call her out on her behavior. 
Can you stop this shit? Please. You want her dead so bad, you don't even care what happens to you. It's not true. You never came off that boat. It's been like talking to a goddamn ghost. Doing the best I can. I'm the one you tell. Me. I don't know how. You gotta try. Unfortunately, Carol still falls into Alpha's trap, taking the rest of the group with her. Now Daryl's leadership skills will really be put to the test. Daryl was always the black sheep, but now it's time for him to step up. Is he stuck in Rick's shadow, or is he an even better leader? Which era of Daryl's life is your favorite? Leave a comment below and let us know.